Okay, question one. Uh, so we're first asked for uh, to state what is meant by a field of force. Um, so this is one that you just need to memorize. Any field of space, uh, sorry, any field of force is a region of space uh, where a particle experiences a force. That's uh, the definition for any field of force. Um, there are then obviously uh, particular uh, definitions for other types of field of force. So, for example, a gravitational force, uh, sorry, a gravitational field of force is a, a regional space where any particle with mass experiences a force. Uh, define the gravitational field strength, that is the force per unit mass. It's important to actually know that it's not uh, force per kilogram of mass because you could have gravitational field strength defined in, for example, uh, pounds of force per mile. Uh, sorry, no, um, sorry no, you, no, you couldn't you say it, pounds of force per pound. Um, so there are there are sort of uh, imperial or other units uh, as well that will still be gravitational field strengths, but obviously for for our purposes it is always per kilogram. Part B: An isolated planet may be assumed to be a uniform sphere of radius 3.39 times 10 to the 6 meters. Uh, just be careful that is radius. I, I think radius is what we're going to want, but always check that it is. Uh, with a mass of uh, 6.42 times 10 to 23 concentrated at the center. Calculate the gravitational field strength on the surface of the planet. Okay, this is one of those ones where you're going to want to just remember your equations. Uh, the easiest way to do that is to remember that gravitational field strength is gm over r squared. Um, you could you could derive that equation. Um, you can say f is gm m over r squared and then you can remember g is force per unit mass uh, so the m's cancel uh, over here and you can uh, you get to this equation or you can just remember the other equation as well substituting in our numbers into that uh, g is in your formula sheet and that is 6.67 times 10 to the negative 11 and I'm multiplying that by the mass of my planet which is 6.42 times 10 to the 23 and uh, if you made a mistake on this chances are you forgot that this R has to be squared very easy to do even when you're just putting on your calculator it's easy to forget that um, and that comes out as uh, 3.73 if you look, I've got three sig fig here, three sig fig here, three sig fig in my uh, constant, so it should be to three significant figures here. Part C. Calculate the height above the surface of the planet in B, where the gravitational field strength is 1% less than the value at the surface of the planet. So um, there's also something to note here, it says height above the surface, um, which is an uh, a little trap that they've laid for you. Um, so, starting off, the uh, gravitational field strength that we are searching for will be 3.73, uh, 3 um, and we want 99% of that, um, so we can say times 0 0.99, because uh, if we're saying it's 1% less, that means it's 99% of. Um, and what I can do is I can just substitute into this equation again and just find a new R. So that's still gm over R squared. Uh, substitute in my numbers, um, rearrange it, and you will find that big R is equal to 3.41 times 10 to the power of 6 meters. So my height will be uh, R1 take away R2, so that will be uh, 3.39 times 10 to the 6 take away 3.41 times 10 to the 6, uh, which I believe, if I can trust the mark scheme, comes out as 2 times 10 to the 4 meters. Um, really, you could give this to three significant figures as well, um, but the mark scheme doesn't require that. 
Question two. We are given the first law of thermodynamics, and then we're asked uh, what everything means. So the first one, the plus Q. Um, when you see this equation, uh, Q always refers to uh, the energy transferred to the system by heating. And the W is always done, is always the work done on the system. Um, just be careful. Uh, the, um, the the definitions here require the idea of energy going into it. Um, so it had to be energy transferred, and this word to was required in the mark scheme, um, and work done on was required. Um, obviously, slightly different words. I think would probably have been accepted as long as they made it clear that you're talking about energy that's going into the system. Um, that doesn't mean that energy can't come out, but if energy does come out, um, then Q and W would need to be negative. And that's kind of hinted at in the in part two, because what does a negative value of delta U mean? Um, that corresponds to uh, a decrease in internal energy of the system. Okay, I'm just gonna uh, zoom out a little bit so we can see both uh, part simultaneously. So we have an ideal gas sealed in a container that undergoes the cycle shown in figure 2.1. And hopefully this type of question is relatively familiar to you. Um, this, this is a fairly uh, commonly reused question. Um, they talk about the gases compressed suddenly so that no thermal en energy enters or leaves uh, during compression. Um, so that would be uh, B to C. Uh, no, it wouldn't. Sorry, that's <laughs> that's absolutely not compression. That's A to B. I mean, uh, right. Uh, the amount of work done is four hundred and eighty joules. Um, so we can say that during this section. It has plus 480 joules of work done on it. Um, and then it gives us some new pressure and volumes. Uh, the gas is now cooled at a constant volume so that uh, between points B and C, 110 joules of thermal energy is lost. So I'm just going to write down here as well. Um, sorry, 1,100, not 110, 1,100 joules being lost there, because that wasn't immediately obvious on the question. Um, and then it gives us the new pressure and temperature again, then says finally is, re is uh, returned to point A, uh, this time by uh, very, very slowly, uh, presumably expanding its container. Okay, so for the next thing you're asked to do is state and explain the total change in internal energy of the gas for one complete cycle. Okay, um, that's not where I wanted you to go. Um, so, relatively common uh, definition here. Um, we can see, hopefully, or hopefully you can see from this that uh, the uh, there is no change, um, and you can see there is no change because there is no change in temperature. Uh, we return to the same volume, uh, you can see that here, because we return to the same volume along here, and our pressure uh, has remained the same as well, and it's a sealed container of gas, um, so in all we must have had no change uh, in internal energy. Part two, calculate the work done on the gas during the expansion from point C to point A. So we're being asked for the work done here. Um, now, it can be tempting to say, well, it's 480 joules um, as we compress from A to B, so it should be 480 going this way. However, you have to remember um, that as I go from A to B, I'm also raising the temperature of my gas. When I go from C to B, a, the temperature is remaining, con sorry, the, sorry, I'm raising the pressure of my gas. Um, when I go from C to A, I'm uh, changing the uh, 
volume, but I'm not changing the pressure. Um, so actually, I would expect delta W here to be less than 480 joules. So let's go ahead and check that. So I can say that the work done is pressure times the change in volume because these pressures aren't uh, changing. Um, and you can either just remember that as an equation or you can say, well, OK, um, I have a cross-sectional area on the, the wall of uh, this and it has a pressure acting against it. Uh, we know that uh, force is pressure multiplied by area um, and I'm compressing it length L. So um, as the pressure is remaining constant, this force is remaining constant. So I can say work done is force times distance because, the, like I said, the, the pressure isn't, the force isn't changing. So this version of the work done equation is valid. Um, so that is pressure times area. D is L. And look at that area times L is volume. So it's PV or P delta V rather, where it's this is the change in volume. So delta V would be this volume change uh, from from compressing it anyway um plug in some numbers then work done um that is uh 1.6 times 10 to the 5 that's the pressure uh and my change in volume will be this is a horror like if Going up in, what have they gone up in? 25. It's, that's hilarious because they will take marks off you for doing that in the exam. You can't, it's CIE. CIE. Um, anyway, um, I'm not going to try and read off this graph on my computer screen because it makes my eyes go funny. Um, but I am reliably informed that this is uh, 2.4 and this is 0 0.87. This might mean that you get slightly different answers. Uh, depending on where you read off from this, um, but the method should be the same. Uh, and that's times 10 to the negative 3 meters. Um, and when you bash that into a calculator, you should get the work done is 240 joules. Um, now I'm asking from C2A, so I'm increasing the volume. Um, that means that I'm actually lowering the amount of work done on my gas. Okay, and now you're asked to complete figure 2.2 uh, to show the changes. Um, so from A to B, uh, that's this one. I've already written that. I know that that is uh, done with no thermal energy enters or leaves, uh, so delta Q must be uh, zero. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> and uh, delta W must be 480. And obviously the, the delta U is the total, so that would be 480 as well. Uh, from B to C, uh, <clears throat> we know that uh, the volume is staying the same, therefore the work done on it must be zero. Delta Q, well, the pressure is dropping, um, so I'm going to be, if the pressure is dropping, I must be removing heat energy. So that will be minus 1,100. Remember, I, uh, I wrote that here uh, from the, the, the text of the question. Uh, and again, delta u is the total of that so that must be minus 1100 and then for uh, the work done by mechanical work well i've written that here that's minus 240 um, and then to find this well i've already set up here that no work is done on this overall so therefore this one must be uh, 480 take, uh, sorry, uh, no, it's uh, 1,100, take away 480, uh, which is 620 joules. Um, and I know that this is uh, the combination of the two of them. Um, so this must be uh, 620 plus 240, 
uh, which comes to 860 joules. Just check that. Uh, 84 to take away 24. Yes, that works. Uh, okay, and then 620 plus 480, that takes to a zero. Yep, good, 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 good. Okay, that should be correct. Check mark scheme. And yes, it is. Question three. With these ideal gas equations or questions, it's really important that you just learn a lot of these facts. Uh, so the first one, state the assumption of the kinetic theory of gases. I would hope that you uh, you know more than just two more. Um, so things we're looking for would be the total volume of molecules uh, should be negligible compared to uh, the... It says the Mark scheme says vessel containing them. Um, this is basically the idea that the distances between them should be much larger than the size of the particles themselves. Um, we have no intermolecular forces of attraction. That's probably the uh, the biggest one that we break in the real world. Um, most of these other ones, they're, they're actually not that important, but the no intermolecular forces of attraction, that does lead to some significant differences in real gases. Um, we assume that all the molecules move with random motion. Really hard to type accurately while you're also trying to read into a microphone. That's my excuse anyway. Um, we're going to, uh, again, kind of when with, um, to help us think about the same thing as, or same uh, vein as the idea of uh, distances between them is much uh, larger than the size of the particles themselves. We'll also assume that the time of the collision uh, is small compared to time spent moving or the time between collisions um, and we'll assume that there is a large number of molecules that's important because um, we're using stats here and stats generalizations uh, so we need to have lots of them before the stats start to work part b the number of molecules per unit volume in an ideal gas is m um, worth noting that uh, number of molecules per unit volume is what they're referring to here because that's going to be relevant uh, for part C later. Um, and then the rest of the um, constants here are pretty similar, or sorry, symbols are pretty yeah, similar to what we've used in the past. Um, and then we get to the idea of for a single particle, we have pressure is one third nmv squared. Um, so the only reason why this expression is modified to give this formula. Um, so this one says that it is assumed that all the molecules are moving with speed v. So what happens here? Well, this, if you remember, this is the rms squared speed. Um, so that is uh, c squared all... Uh, so, so what we do is we add up all the individual velocities, uh, square them, then square root, uh, sorry, square all the velocities, add them up, then square root it, and then we're actually squaring it again. Um, or oh, I suppose we could just take, or oh, just not square root it, I suppose that would, that would also work. Um, why do we do that? Um, that is because uh, in a real gas, there is a range of velocities. Um, so that means that uh, some will have to be larger or smaller, so we need to average them um, in order to get a, a more generalized thing. And that comes back to, again, we need a large number of molecules so that we can say that they all, on average, uh, have the same velocity, but we need to, to take account of that. Part C. The density of an ideal gas is 1.2 kilograms per meter cubed at a pressure of 1.0 times 10 to the 5 pascals and a temperature of 27 degrees. Uh, calculate the RMS speed of the molecules of the gas at 27 degrees. Um, so the first thing to note is that this temperature is actually um, a bit of a red herring. Although it might become useful later, we don't actually need to use it for this because we can see there is no temperature component in this equation here. Um, the second thing you might notice, well, I've got to get this nm, and that's a little bit tricky because um, I don't have that. I have a uh, density, and I haven't been given a number of particles, so, so what's going on here? 
Well, um, the key thing is that this is talking about the number of molecules per unit volume. Um, so if I'm doing N multiplied by M, what that's actually saying is the mass per unit volume. Because I'm taking the mass of a single particle, multiplying it by the total number of uh, particles per unit volume. So overall, I'm ending up with the mass per unit volume. And that is the same as pressure. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to replace Nm with density rho, because that's the same thing. Um, I'm guessing some of you may have just done that because you thought, well, I've got to plug a number in here anyway. Um, and some of you, I'm sure, will have worked that out yourselves. Um, but that's why that works. Um, so then we substitute in our numbers. So that's one third times 1.2. There's no units there. This is all in base units. Good. Uh, one third times. Uh, sorry, and that's uh, the pressures here. 1.0 times 10 to the 5 is c squared. Um, so when you rearrange that, you should get c squared is 2.5 times 10 to the 5. Square root that, and you should get crms is 500 meters per second. Part Three, sorry, part two, calculate the RMS speed of the molecules at 207 degrees. Um, so for this, you just need to remember that what is temperature? Well, temperature is just a measure of the average velocity of a particle. That's what it actually means. Um, so the mark scheme's written it quite nicely. Um, they just say, well, temperature is proportional to uh, CRMS squared. Um, so what I can say is that uh, the CRMS squared at the, uh, how should I do this, let's do it 1 and 2. Uh, yeah, so that over the new one, that is equal to the ratio of the uh, temperatures. So uh, to get that, uh, I need to convert, uh, because I cannot leave these in Celsius, I need to convert them into centigrades, sorry, into Kelvins. So that becomes 300 over 480. Um, I know what C, let's, let's actually let's write this out more formally. Rather than do 3 at this, let's write the full equation. Um, so the ratios are going to be the same. So that will be uh, T1 over T2. Um, so I can say that uh, I've already got C1. That's uh, 500 squared, which let's just, let's just do it properly. Let's do 500 squared over C2 RMS is t1 over t2 so that's uh 300 over 480 rearrange that i get c2 rms squared uh where's that going to go uh, i don't know what i what that squiggle means but ignore that squiggle uh, multiply that divide by that so that should be uh 500 squared multiplied by 480 divided by 300. Yep, that looks reasonable. Um, plug that into a calculator and you should get, uh, I'm asked for the, sorry, not the root mean squared. This is just the mean squared. So I don't need to square root it at the end, which is a little bit tricky. Um, and you can notice that as well because they've given this uh, as a square term over here. Um, so when you bash that into a calculator, you should get 4.0 times 10 to the 5. My commiserations if you did square root it, because that's what I was about to do until I glanced at the mark scheme. So that's, embar that's embarrassing. Question four. So again, uh, being asked for a definition, so why it's really important to go and learn those. 
definition of a poten uh, sorry of a electric potential at a point that is the work done uh, per unit charge moving a charge from infinity to that point um, so remember that for that one um, it can be positive or negative Part B, two point charges A and B are separated by a distance of 120 centimetres in a vacuum as illustrated below. Uh, the charge on A is plus 2.0 times 10 to the 9 coulombs. Uh, a point P lies upon the, upon the two, uh, on the line joining the two, and the variation uh, in electric potential at point P is shown below. So you're asked to find the charge of B. Um, and looking at this, we can see that as we go from A towards B, um, we are constantly reducing our work done per unit charge. In other words, if I have a positive charge to go from infinity all the way up to uh, point A, I'm going to have to put in a lot of work. But as I go closer and closer and closer to point B, work's coming out. So the first thing I'm going to do right at the start is I'm going to put a minus sign here because I can see if I'm constantly getting work out as I go from A to B, and remember we always say a positive test charge um, is, is used to define electric, uh, electric potential. Um, if I'm getting work out, then uh, it must be being attracted to point B, which means point B must be negative. So I'm going to put that in there straight away. Um, now, what else can I say from looking at this? Well, the, the, the feature of interest on this graph is here, um, where I have a point where the potential between the two is equal. When I get to that point, I can say, so let's say, uh, let's call this point uh, X. Why not? So I can say at this point X, Uh, the potential due to charge A is equal to the potential due to charge B. In other words, um, to get to this point, I've had to do no overall work on my charge. It's balanced there. So I just need to remember that uh, the potential is equal to Q over 4 pi epsilon naught are. Be really careful with that. It's very easy in these equations to, to get confused between when do you square R and when do you not square R. This is one of those uh, without R being squared. Um, so let's just substitute into this equation. So uh, V due to A at this point, uh, we've already been given A, that is uh, 2 times 10 to the negative 9. So that will be 2 times 10 to the negative 9 divided by 4 times pi times uh, epsilon naught uh, multiplied by r. Uh, so I'm going to call this uh, r of a. So that is 4 centimeters. That's going to be 4.0 times 10 to the negative 2 uh, to convert out of centimeters. So do take care of that. Um, and that is going to be equal to uh, Q, which I'm interested in. So I'm going to call this QB. That's what I'm trying to find. Uh, divided by 4 times pi times epsilon naught times uh, what's our B here. Uh, that's 8 centimetres. That would be 8.0 times 10 to the negative 2. Can I be a little bit sneaky? I think I can. I can cancel out my 4 pi epsilon noughts. Um, I can also go ahead and cancel out that. Um, so I should get QB is 2 times 10 to the negative 9 uh, over 4.0. Not times it. Excuse me. Uh, not times anything because I cancelled that. Um, you don't need to do this cancellation part, by the way. I'm just uh, being slightly lazy. Uh, multiplied by 8. Um, okay, and check that. That should come out as. Yeah, that looks about reasonable. Uh, 4.0 times 10 to the negative 9 
coulombs. Part B. Uh, the change in electric potential when point P moves from the position where x equals 9 centimetres to uh, x is 3. So you're asked to use the figure to determine that. Okay, so this is quite easy. I'm just asking for the change in potentials. This is just reading off a graph. Um, we can see that at uh, 9 centimetres... Also, I do... I'm just going to go back to this one, actually. Um, I kind of covered up my negative signs. Let's make sure it's really clear this is a negative sign because that was necessary for a mark. Anyway, go back to this. Uh, so I've gone from uh, from negative 9 uh, up to, uh, well, I'm taking it to 3 centimetres, uh, that looks like uh, plus 2. Uh, so my total change it will be uh, 12, and this is, uh, check the axis, so there will be a total change of 12 times 10 to the 2, which is 1,200 volts. Um, and it's a little bit of a clue there. Even if you weren't totally sure, you can say, well, hang on, I mean, this this changes in the units of volts, so it kind of makes sense that it's just this change on the graph. Part C, an alpha particle... Oh, sorry, and uh, let's go back to this again. The change, um, I'm going from negative to positive, so I'm going up on this graph, so this should have a plus sign in front of it. Part C, an alpha particle moves along a line joining uh, point charges A and B in figure 5.1. Uh, okay, so it's going, let's say, okay, the alpha particle moves from a position where x equals 9 and just reaches the position where x equals 3. So the alpha particle is moving that way. Uh, when it says just reaches, that would make sense because it's moving towards the uh, positive charge. So we would expect that the alpha particle will be having to overcome repulsion from A and attraction to B. Uh, use your answer in part B2 to calculate the speed V of the alpha particle, alpha particle at the position where X is 9 centimetres. Okay, so if it's saying it just reaches that position, what we can assume is that it's used up all of its kinetic energy. So it's kind of going from a high velocity here, slowing down, slowing down, and then stopping um, at this point here. Um, so we'll call this, let's call this... Uh, y and z okay uh so you're asked to calculate the speed of the alpha particle so um what i'm going to do is uh say well, what's energy transfer going here the the change in kinetic energy uh that will be equal to the change in uh, electric potential uh energy uh I'd say probably not the right unit, but I can't remember right now. Um, and what is that change in electrical potential energy or electrical energy? That's going to be uh, Q times V. If you remember, uh, electric potential is work done per unit charge. Well, now I don't have a per unit charge. I have an actual charge given to me. Um, so I'm going to say that the change in, in uh, kinetic energy is a half mv squared. Um, and that is equal to my electrical energy, which is uh, the uh, charge of my particle. Um, I could use a big Q, I suppose, but actually, generally, when we're dealing with multiple charges, we use a little Q uh, times my change in voltage. So, start substituting some numbers in. Uh, to find the mass, well, you need to remember that an alpha particle has an atomic mass of 4, so that would be 4 times the mass of a single proton. Uh, we're going to, but for questions like this, we can assume that the mass of a proton and a neutron are exactly about the same, and we can assume that uh, the uh, electron mass is negligible, so that's fine to do, uh, and that's V squared. That is equal to my charge. Now remember this is an alpha particle, so the charge on that is twice the charge on an electron. So it's 2 times 1.60 times 10 to the negative 19, which is the charge on an electron, multiplied by my change in voltage, which is 1,200. Uh, go and rearrange that and plug it into your calculator, and you should get a velocity once you square root it. Don't forget to square root it, because obviously this is V squared. That is uh, 3.4 times 10 to the power of 5, 5 meters per second. Question 5. So we've got a spring hung vertically from a fixed point and a mass m is hung from the other end of the spring as shown. 
Nice to place downward and release, and it's going to bounce up and down with simple harmonic motion. Uh, the variation in time with length L of the spring, so length is the total length of the spring, is shown below. Um, so one thing to note from this graph then, um, it's not immediately, I would say, intuitively obvious that uh, at here, this is maximum extension uh, and this is minimum extension. So in other words, when it's here, it looks like that. Uh, when it's here, it looks like that. It's stretched more. Um, just worth keeping in mind when you see something like that. Uh, then you're asked to state one time at which it is moving with maximum speed. So if you remember, this uh, speed is just distance over time. So you can, uh, any of these points, these points where it's got the maximum gradient, uh, will be fine. Um, so I'm just going to read off the most uh, obvious one, which is 0 0.1 seconds. Um, and you could have had 0 0.1, 0 0.3, uh, 0 0.5, and so on. State one time which a spring has maximum elastic potential energy. If it's got maximum elastic potential energy, that's when it needs to be most stretched. Um, and I've just realised that I've drawn these diagrams exactly what I was saying to avoid doing. <laughs> I've drawn these diagrams the wrong way around. So it just goes to show it probably is worth being aware of that. So this is when it says it's most stretched. This is when it's at its least stretched. So I'm looking for one of these points. Um, so I'm just going to say it's at time 0 seconds, but you could have also had 0 0.4 or 0 0.8 seconds. Okay, use the data from figure 3, uh, figure 3.2 to determine for the motion of the mass the angular frequency omega. So if you remember, angular frequency is just the number of radians covered per second, so it's 2 pi over t. So what we need to do is find the time period. Um, I can pick any pair of results from the graph. I'm just going to pick those ones. Uh, that's from 0 0.3 to 0 0.7, uh, which gives us a time period of 0 0.4 seconds. So I can say omega is 2 pi over 0 0.4. Uh, which comes out as 15.7 radians per second. Um, now this is only really to one significant figure, so I'm only going to give this to two sig fig, which is 16. For part two, um, this is one of the very few occasions where they actually give you an equation that you can use. Um, we've got the velocity in our equation sheet, the velocity of a particle in SHM, um, and we know that for any moment it's plus or minus the... Uh, angular velocity, which I've already calculated, multiplied by the square root of the maximum amplitude to take away the amplitude at a particular point in time. So at, a, at the maximum uh, velocity of it, um, that will occur uh, when x is 0, because it's at its uh, equilibrium point. So I just need to find the maximum amplitude. Uh, so reading off from here, that is from 12 to, uh, I think that's, what's that, that's 14.24, 14.5, I would say, that about looks like. Uh, so from 12 to 14.5, that gives me a uh, amplitude, let's call that x naught actually, amplitude of uh, 2.5 centimetres. Be careful with that because they do try to trip you up. Uh, so maximum speed will be... Now in the mark scheme, they've used this 15.7 value again, um, which I, I'm not totally on board with. I think you should be able to use both, but let's, uh, let's do it their way. Um, so maximum velocity is uh, omega times... Uh, this will be uh, maximum displacement squared take away zero, so that will just be uh, maximum displacement squared, or square rooted, so that will just be uh, x zero. So uh, v max will be, let's say do it in the way they do it in the mark scheme, 15.0 times, and what did I say? I think I said it was 2.5, yeah, 2.5 times 10 to the negative 2 centimetres which is our maximum amplitude. Um, there was a few little tricks there where it's kind of quite easy just to read off the graph rather than remember that you want to uh, 
subtract the uh, the equilibrium um, length of the spring. There were kind of a, a few sneaky little uh, things trying to trip you up in there. But once you do that, you should come out with uh, 6.2 meters per second. Part C. Uh, the mass M is now suspended from two springs, each identical to that shown in Figure 3.1, as shown. Um, and then you're just to you're asked to suggest and explain the change, if any, in the period of oscillation of the mass. A numerical answer is not required. Well, that's nice of them. They could have asked you to do that. Um, just a reminder: I know you guys obviously didn't sit the uh, AS exam, but this is just about springs in parallel. Um, so, what are we expecting? Um, so two springs in parallel, that's going to have a greater uh, spring constant. If it has a greater spring constant, we have a greater restoring force. Uh, so there's more force, uh, every time I displace it, there's more force acting on it. Um, that's going to give a greater acceleration uh, of my um, spring. Um, so that's going to give a greater maximum speed and all of those things are going to combine to give a shorter time period. Um, you needed that shorter time period there to get uh, one mark and you needed any reason on there to get the second mark, although I would hope that all of you can give all those reasons. Question 6. You're asked to suggest an explanation for each of the following observations. Um, and I'll be honest, the first one kind of threw me a little bit. It says two wires are laid side by side and carry equal currents I in opposite directions, as shown in figure 6.1. So you can see they're very close together. And then it says the total magnetic flux density due to the current in the wires is negligible. Well, I don't know, I guess it just threw me a little bit because the way it's worded, it sounds a bit like that's just kind of more information for the next part. But actually, they're asking you to explain this sentence that the total magnetic flux density in the wires is negligible. Um, so um, I actually tend to go the opposite direction to the way that it does in the mark scheme because I think it kind of makes sense. So what I would say is that each wire has its own magnetic field um, and we can say that the magnetic fields superpose uh, on each other. Um, and I guess then we can say um, the magnitude of the fields is equal because they have the same current um, and you don't actually need the the equation for the current in a wire you can look it up online if you want to um, but we know that it's directly proportional to current everything else is the same so the magnitudes are going to be equal um, but the uh, direction of the two fields is opposite and as a result of that you're adding equal but opposite fields so the resultant field is zero because you're adding them together. Um, just to wear, just be aware from the mark scheme, um, adding together the fields to get zero, that was worth a mark, but only if you also said that the magnetic fields are in equal magnitude and opposite directions. So if, even if you had the fact that they add together to get zero, um, you wouldn't get that mark unless you'd also said the previous one. So that's denoted in the mark scheme um, by the first two being M marks and the second one being an A mark. Part B, an air cord solenoid, that just means it's empty, so it's just an empty coil of wire, is connected in series with a battery. An iron core is inserted into the solenoid, an EM, sorry, as an iron core is inserted into the solenoid, an EMF opposes the EMF of the battery, is induced. Um, so, um, there's a couple of things to say. Now, the first thing I'm going to say doesn't actually get you a mark, but I think it's important to note. Um, so the first thing is the current in the coil uh, induces a magnetic field in the core, or in the coil, sorry. Um, that's important to understand because then we can say um, that adding the core increases the magnitude of the magnetic flux. Um, and then again, there's uh, other examples. They might talk about this a little bit. It's about it's about the um, uh, a, a 
quantity called the permittivity of free space and it talks about basically how easy it is to push a magnetic field through it. Iron is easier to put a magnetic field inside than air so when you add the core uh, you end up creating a stronger magnetic field. So this was the first thing to say was adding the core increases the strength of this magnitude of the magnetic field. Um, and what we can then say is that uh, this causes an increase in magnetic flux linkage um, and I think it's probably worth saying as well that it uh, allows more magnetic flux to cut the coils of the solenoid. Um, and from there it's a pretty simple just uh, of using our basic laws. We can say that by Faraday's law a change in magnetic flux linkage, which is what we have, causes an induce or induce. Let's say need to causes an induce. We can just say induces an EMF, um, and then we can say that by Lenz's law, this opposes the battery, which is what we see in the question itself. Question seven. A student using a power supply that produces a sinusoidal output. Uh, the meters and supply show that the output voltage V has an RMS root mean square value of 14 with a frequency of 750 hertz. Uh, the variation uh, with time t of the output voltage may be represented by this equation, which is the standard one that you will also see in the formula sheet. So the first thing you're asked to do is to help calculate the value of V0. So this, remember, is the peak value. Um, so you, seem, you should remember that uh, V0 is equal to VRMS divided by the square root of 2. Uh, sorry, not divided by, multiplied by, which actually brings me on to a nice little uh, reminder. Um, I mean, I, I personally struggle with that. So what I tend to do is I remember that um, the V peak value is going to be higher. Um, and I know that it's got, a, it's got a square root of 2 in there. So I can never remember, is it divide by square root of 2 or multiply by square root of 2? Well, just remember, um, it has to be something that's bigger. So obviously it's going to be multiplied by because uh, square root of 2 is about 1.4. So I want to multiply to get it bigger. Um, so when you do that, that will be uh, 14 multiplied by the square root of 2, which comes out as 19.8 volts. Uh, omega, so this is an angular frequency. Ang no, that's not how you spell angular. Uh, angular frequency. So to calculate that, I can say that uh, omega is 2 pi over t, sorry, over capital T. Uh, time period is 1 over the frequency, therefore omega is 2 pi f. So that will be 2 times pi times 750, which is about 7,400 radians per second. Part B. A capacitor with a large capacitance connected across the terminals of the uh, supply suggests and explain why this might lead to a large current. Um, so for this one we want the idea that a uh, large capacitance uh, requires a large amount of charge in order to uh, fully charge. I'm using the word charge there twice but you get the idea. Um, frequency is high. So there is, uh, so uh, needs to gain or lose that charge quickly. Um, so large charge changing rapidly uh, results in a high current since uh, current is change in charge divided by time taken. So we've got a uniform, sorry, an electron travelling in a uh, vacuum at a constant, sorry, at a speed uh, that's relatively high. 
Um, so we're dealing with something that's close to the, uh, well, a tenth of the speed of light. Um, enters a region of uniform magnetic field of flux density 32 millitesla. Um, I'm just going to write underneath that 3.2 times 10 to the negative 3 tesla, just so I don't forget it. Um, and the first thing you're asked to do is you're given the direction of it, um, and there is a component of its velocity which is normal to the direction of the magnetic field that causes it to follow a circular path find that. Um, so if you think of this as a triangle, we're being asked to find VH, sorry, VN, VN. Now I always remember that as it's just V sine 30 when you're asked for something like this, um, because I'm taking this 30 degree angle and I'm stretching it out to find the component that goes that way. If however you don't feel comfortable with doing that, we can just draw a triangle to find that. So there's my VN and this is V. And I've been given the theta here. Um, so V is my hypotenuse, Vn is my opposite. So if you remember, so Katoa, sine of theta is opposite uh, over hypotenuse. Uh, so that will be, uh, so to, to rearrange that, uh, hypotenuse multiplied by sine theta is the opposite. Hypotenuse is V. So it'll be V sine 30 equals VH, just to prove that. Um, when you bash that into your calculator, V sine 30, um, do make sure, especially if you've been using radians earlier, you have uh, switched yourself back to degrees. Um, and when you do that, you should get 1.7 uh, times 10 to the 7. That seems about reasonable because we're expecting something large, but obviously not as big as this because it should be smaller than the hypotenuse. It's only a component of it. Part two, calculate the radius of this circular path. Um, so what you need to remember is that we are only interested in the component that is perpendicular to the field. That's the only bit that causes this uh, radius. So we're just going to start from basic principles. And whenever you're asked to find this, you must uh, work this out from first principles. It seems to be something that CIE are quite particular about. So we're going to say... Um, that the force uh, causing centripetal acceleration is equal to the force due to the magnetic flux, so the magnetic field. So, uh, force due to centripetal force is mv squared over r, and that is equal to uh, the magnetic field strength, which is bqv, or in this case bev, um, because this is a, an electron. And I'm going to say that uh, we want the horizontal, the, sorry, the, I keep writing this as H. It shouldn't be H, it should be N, shouldn't it? Uh, this is the normal component that we're interested in. Uh, so when I do that, um, I'm going to find that uh, my masses should cancel. Sorry, there's no M, is there? So uh, that, sorry, that becomes sub bleh, substitute everything in. Uh, R is going to be equal to uh, mv squared over be. So the mass of an electron is 9.11 times 10 to the negative 31 uh, multiplied by this horizontal component. Don't forget to square it. So that's 1.7 times 10 to the 7 all squared divided by uh, B is in. That's a good job that I uh, converted that out of millitesla. So that's uh, 3.2 times 10 to negative 3. Uh, and then I want the charge on an electron, uh, which is 1.60 times 10 to negative 19. When you plug all that into your calculator, you should get 0.03 meters. Um, and we want this to 3, at least two sig fig, let's do it to two sig fig, because that number's two sig fig, that number's two sig fig, and those ones come from the data sheet, so actually it's better to do it to uh, two sig fig. Part B, state the magnitude of the force, if any, on the electromagnetic field due to the component uh, of velocity along the direction. Well, that will be zero, because uh, it has to be perpendicular. And then part C, use the information from A and B to describe the resultant path of the electron in the magnetic field. So to do this, let's think about Fleming's left hand rule. Um, you've got your first finger, uh, so the magnetic field is going that way. Your uh, current finger is going to be pointing downwards. So what you should find 
is that you get your thumb pointing up out of it. So what's going to happen is as my electron travels in, it's going to sort of spiral, but it's going to be going upwards. Um, well, it's going to, sorry, no, it's not going to do that. It's going to spiral in a coil. Um, so it's not going to be going upwards. Sorry, no, it's going to spiral in a coil sort of in the upwards direction like that. So it's going to sort of spiral along that line. So we can describe, not spiral, because spiral in, uh, indicates a changing radius. Um, so I'm going to call this a helix or a coil because it does have a constant radius as it goes. Question 9. You are asked to define the capacitance of a parallel plate capacitor, another one that you really just need to remember. Um, so capacitance, uh, you, could, you might want to start with the equation. Um, so we can remember uh, C is Q over V. Um, so um, to put that into words, uh, capacitance is the uh, charge, it helps if I could spell it, charge per unit potential difference um, and remember that um, that is on one plate oops, on one plate of the capacitor um, it is important that you uh, include that because if you remember each plate of a capacitor is oppositely charged so the overall charge in a capacitor is always zero so when we talk about capacitance we're talking about a single plate state some functions of uh, capacitors is one that you just need to remember um, so it's for smoothing alternating current or smoothing ripples um, you can use it for timing circuits because you can use it to the time it takes a discharge um, you can use them for tuning um, circuits that use radios and things like that although you haven't really done that much yet um, you can use them again as oscillators kind of in the same vein um, you can use them to block or filter uh, di direct current. You can actually use them for filtering uh, other uh, signals as well. They're quite. You can do some quite clever things with uh, with them under those circumstances. Um, oops. Why are you doing that? Let me copy you. I'm probably pasting these in somewhere that I don't want to be. Well, that's all gone horribly wrong. Um, okay, I'll just make it, I'll just make it larger. Um, what else could you do with them? Um, you can also use them for surge protection. Uh, that's something, again, we'll talk a little bit about um, when you think about uh, maybe some of the applications of uh, electronics. Um, you can also use them as a, a temporary power supply um, for a very short period of time. Part B, a student has available four capacitors, each of which has a capacitance of 24 microfarads. The capacitor connectors are shown below. Uh, calculate the combined capacitance. So what I would do here, um, this is a pretty classic thing that they do, um, is they kind of set them out in a way that's a little bit confusing. Not terribly confusing, um, but it can trip you up. So what I do is actually rewrite it like this. Once you spot that this is what you have, um, then it becomes very straightforward. Uh, we have three capacitors in series, uh, in parallel with a single capacitor by itself. Now, the only other thing you need to remember is, uh, I know it's either we add them or we do one over them, so how do we know which way to combine them? Um, I always remember, let's look at this, well, these ones are in parallel, so the charge is going to be spread across these two plates, it can go on both of these, so when they're in parallel, you're going to increase the capacitance, because there's going to be more total charge that you can store on those plates. So, uh, for these ones you're going to do 1 over it so I can say 1 over the total capacitance is 1 over 24 plus 1 over 24 plus 1 over 24 uh, so the total becomes 24 over 3 which is 8 microfarads I've then got them in parallel with this one so the final capacitance is 8 microfarads plus the one from that one so we get a total of 32 microfarads. Question 10. 
Iodine-131 is a radioactive isotope with a decay constant of 9.9 9 times 10 to the negative second negative one seconds. So what is meant by radioactive? So when we're talking about something radioactive we mean it is uh, has an unstable nucleus which emits uh, ionizing radiation spontaneously. It's good to have that word spontaneous in there because remember we can't control it or cause it. Uh, the decay constant, um, this is the probability per unit time of decay. Um, so it's a probability that the uh, nucleus will decay each second for a single nucleus. So they're usually very, very low um, because, for th especially for things that have half-lives of you know, a couple of hundred years, um, you certainly wouldn't expect one single nucleus to decay within one second. Part B, some water becomes contaminated with iodine-131. The activity of iodine-131 in one kilo of water is 560 becquerels. Remember that means uh, counts per second. Determine the number of iodine-131 atoms in one kilo of water. Um, so this is a relatively straightforward one. Um, so this is uh, the activity of a single atom, um, and we have the total activity here. So all we need to do is say that the activity is the total number of atoms that we have, multiplied by the probability of a single one decaying, um, and that will give you the activity per second. Therefore, the total number of atoms will be the activity in one second divided by the probability of a single atom decaying in a second. Uh, so that becomes 560 divided by 9.9 uh, .9 times 10 to the negative 7, uh, which comes out as 5.7 times 10 to the power 8, which is really very, very low indeed. Um, we're talking to much less than a gram here. Oh, much less than, yeah, much less than a gram, because a gram would be, uh, well, Less than a gram? Yeah, probably. Yeah, much less than a gram, what I'm talking about. Much less than a gram. Uh, part C. Act, uh, regulations require that the activity of ID-131 in one kilo of water is to be less than 170 becquerels. Um, calculate the time in days for the activity in the contaminated water B to be reduced to 170. So for this one, you just need to know the formula. Activity at any given time is equal to the activity at time t is 0, multiplied by e to the negative uh, decay constant multiplied by time. Um, so uh, we're going to say we're going to start the clock at this moment. Uh, so this is at t equals zero. Um, so we're trying to find the t at which the activity reaches 170. So I'm looking for 170 is equal to our initial activity, which is 560, multiplied by e to the power of negative 9.9 .9 times 10 to the negative 7, multiplied by t. Um, so I'm just going to do it this, this long way because I know that some of you uh, don't do this very often, if you're, uh, especially if you don't take A-level maths. Uh, so E by itself is 170 over 560. Um, and then I'm going to take natural log of both sides. So I can say minus 9.9 .9 times 10 to the negative 7t is equal to natural log of 170 over 560. t by itself is natural log of 170 over 560 divided by 9.9 .9 times 10 to the negative 7. So t comes out as uh, 1.2 times 10 to the 6 seconds. So then I need to get it into days. So to convert it into days, I need to say, right, this is how many seconds it is. So I want 24 uh, hours multiplied by 60, multiplied by 60 to get it in seconds. And when you do that, you get about 14 days.
Now, I've got to admit, I have a real soft spot for question 11. Uh, this is actually a, a restatement of the Cavendish experiment, which went, which was used to uh, find the value of g. Um, and I'll be honest, this is something where I, I often find it, I, I don't normally bother teaching the Cavendish experiment because I think it's quite difficult to understand. Um, but this question is fantastic and I'm going to be using it in my future teaching because I think it's a really nice way of describing how it actually worked. It's, it's, a, it's a great question um, and shows some really good thinking about physics. So, let's start with uh, the basic uh, equation. Uh, they asked for the equation for um, uh, the force uh, between uh, the force due to gravity. So we're going to start with the equation uh, F is big G M1 M2 over R squared. And then we need to uh, define Okay, well, actually, it says F. It's given M and oh, sorry, it's not M1 and M2. Big M and little M, um, and it's already said that they are spread by distance x. So I've done that completely wrong, which is again an example of why one should read the question before trying to answer it. So let's try that again. Um, the way that they've defined it, we would say F is big G multiplied by big M multiplied by little m over x, which is the distance them. Um, and they're also asking for any constants that you or any other symbols that you've used. Uh, so G is the universal gravitational constant. Surprisingly hard to spell and type and speak simultaneously. Right, let's just uh, zoom out a little bit so we can see both pages together. Um, right, we're now asked uh, a small sphere is attached to one end of a rod, as shown. Um, and you're asked, so we're saying, as we can see it here, so we've got a rod hanging down. And then if you're looking, so this is looking at it from above. It does say there, view from above. Um, so what they've done is they've kind of brought in the large sphere at the side here. Um, and what we're seeing is it's twisting around that way um, and it's twisting around to face it. So it says there is a force of attraction between spheres S and L. Uh, let's just make this a little bit more obvious. This is large sphere, this is small sphere. Uh, causing sphere S to move through a distance of 1.2 millimeters. The line drawn in the rods, uh, sorry, the line drawn in the centers of S and L is normal to the rod. Um, first thing you're asked to do is show that the angle theta through which the rod rotates is 1.5 times 10 to the minus 2 radians. Now it's interesting that they've used radians. Can you see this line here is curved? So what we're going to use is we're going to use the idea of radians. So we can say that theta is just very simply uh, the radius, o sorry, the uh, arc length over radius. So that's 1.2 times 10 to the negative 3, because I've got to convert it out of millimetres, over 8.0 times 10 to the negative 2, because that is in centimetres. Um, and when you bash that into your calculator, you should get 1.5 times 10 to the negative 2 metres. So, uh, sorry, metres. Uh, 1.5 times 10 to the negative 2 radians. Part two. Uh, the rotation of the rod causes the thread to twist. The torque T in newton meters required to twist the threads through an angle beta, which is in radians, is given by uh, this expression here. Calculate the torque in the thread when the sphere is in the position as shown in figure uh, 1.2. So we're assuming they're in its new position. Um, so in this case, therefore, beta is that angle that we had, uh, which is 1.5 times 10 to the negative 2. Um, and it does say here beta is in radians, so we don't need to do any conversions into degrees here. Um, so the tension will just be 9.3 times 10 to the negative 10 multiplied by 1.5 times 10 to the negative 2. Uh, which comes out as 1.4 times 10 to negative 11 newton meters. Okay, the distance between the centers of the spheres S and L is 6 centimeters. That's marked in the diagram as well. The mass of sphere S is 7.5 grams and the mass of sphere L is 1.3 kilograms. Uh, by equating the torque in B2, 
to the moment about the thread produced by gravitational attraction, calculate the value V for gravitational constant. All right. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to use moments, um, and I'm going to say that the, what is this? This is a anti-clockwise moment is equal to 1.4 times 10 to the negative 11 Newton meters. Um, and that is equal to the force uh, uh, due to gravity. So it's kind of going up like that. There's F due to gravity. Uh, multiplied by the distance which is 8 centimeters so that's 8.0 times 10 to the negative 2. Uh, so I can then say force due to gravity is 1.4 times 10 to the negative 11 divided by 8.0 times 10 to the negative 2 um, and that is equal to the force of gravitational attraction which is gm1 so that's big m uh, big m is 1.3 so g times 1 what's well, actually that's, that's Let's just do it this way, yeah, G, M, M over, uh, well, you, we might as well use X, let's say X squared. Um, actually, let's check, go back to my earlier answer, did I say X squared? I didn't, so let's just change that answer. Worth remembering, that should be X squared, sorry about that. Uh, right, so G, M over X squared, uh, so G is, uh, where is G? Uh, not in this formula sheet, so I'll just uh, look it up very quickly. I think it's six. Oh yeah, there it is. Uh, so that is six point six seven times ten to the negative eleven multiplied by one point three multiplied by, and this is in grams. Uh, so that would be multiplied by 7.5 times 10 to the negative 3, because I need to convert that, uh, over 8.0, no, 6.0, sorry, because that's this distance. This distance here is x for the separation, or more conventionally, we'd use r. Uh, 6.0 times 10 to the negative 2, because that's in centimetres, must remember to square it. Phew! Uh, and I'm trying to find G, aren't I? Sorry. I'm trying to find G. So there's G. Uh, so then I multiply both sides. Uh, and when you um, plug all that into a calculator, do your rearrangements. Um, you know you're looking for something in the order of 6.67. Uh, but this one comes out as 6.4, excuse me, times 10 to the negative 11, um, which is close enough to this that we can be pretty sure we've probably not made any mistakes. If you ever get, if, if you get something huge, um, then the chances are you've made a mistake. If you get something much, much smaller, the chances are you made a mistake. But we're in the same, uh, the same order of magnitude, so we should be fine. Uh, the last thing it's asking for is uh, suggest why the total force between spheres may not be equal to the force calculated. Um, so it's not asking here for experimental inaccuracies um, because it is saying basically why is the force not what theoretically it should be. It's not saying why do you measure a different force, it's saying why isn't the force it. Um, so basically it's asking for what are the assumptions of Newton's laws of gravitation. So there's lots of things you could say. Um, you could say the law only applies to point masses, um, we can generalize to um, assume, treat most things as point masses, but actually it, it, it does require that. Um, it also requires um, the radii to be um, the radii to be much smaller than the distances between them, but in this case, um, radii are not much smaller than distance between the spheres. Um, spheres might not be uniform, uh, it also requires that, um, and there's a couple of other things that you will uh, see in the mark scheme, but those are the main key ones that were that were important and kind of more general. There were a few things that could have been unique to this particular case, um, like having some electrostatic charge on the rod and the mass that could also have uh, created forces, but these are the ones that are really important. Question 12. Light of a wavelength lambda is instant on the metal surface having work function phi. Photoelectrons maximum kinetic energy E 
max are instant on the surface. State an equation relating phi e max and lambda, explaining the other symbols that you use. Okay, um, so I always remember this as uh, E is equal to HF, that's the energy of a photon, and I also remember that uh, uh, energy of the photon is equal to the work function plus e k max. So I've got to try and get this into the form lambda so we can also use uh, f is uh, c lambda. Yeah, c lambda. Uh, no, it isn't. c over lambda. Of course it is. Sorry. Uh, f is c over lambda. Remember that. Uh, v is f lambda. Yeah, there we go. Um, so the equation that we're going to use is, and, I, and obviously I would put this in the box, but it's uh, it's hard to type on there at the same time. Um, I can say, therefore, that hc over lambda is equal to phi plus e k max. Um, and I just need to uh, define my other terms. So I need to say h equals Planck's constant. Uh, and I need to say that c is the speed of light. Uh, my uh, computer's gone and tried to capitalize those, but make sure you do use the correct case. Okay, part B, the variation in 1 over lambda with ek max is shown in the figure below. By reference in your answer to part A, explain why the gradient does not depend on it. Um, so if I rearrange it, I can say ek max is hc over lambda minus phi. Um, so I can say that uh, this is lambda, so I can say that uh, this is also equal to h over, sorry, uh, hc multiplied by 1 over lambda. Um, so hc is my gradient, uh, while 1 over lambda is my x coordinate. Um, so what they were looking for was for you to say the gradient of the line is hc. H and C are constants, so the gradient is a constant, um, and we can say that H and C are constants independent of metals, they're universal uh, uh, they're not, they're, they're universal constants of the universe, they don't depend on a particular uh, substance. Part B. The work function of sodium is 2.28 electron volts. Determine the minimum wavelength lambda naught at which Ek max is zero. Okay, so um, probably the first thing to do here is to make sure that you're confident rearranging this. Uh, so when we see 2.28 electron volts, we can say that is equal to uh, 2.28 multiplied by the charge on an electron. Uh, which is 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19 joules. Um, so that comes out as uh, 3.65 times 10 to the minus 19 joules. Uh, so now let's rearrange this equation. Uh, I can say that uh, lambda, what's lambda equal to? Lambda will be equal to uh, e k max mine no plus phi uh, no I can't do it in my head I'm trying to do it but I'm thinking speaking and working it out at the same time uh, is not working for me so HC over lambda minus phi uh, so e I'm just going to abbreviate this to e for now e plus phi is hc over lambda. Uh, lambda is, multiply by that, divide by ek, uh, hc over e max plus phi. e max is zero, so this becomes lambda is h times c, uh, which is, sorry, sorry for lambda naught, aren't I? Uh, h is 6.6. .6 3 times 10 to the negative 34. C is 2, oh, sorry, yeah, we're going to use 3.0, aren't we? Uh, 3.0 times 10 to the power 8 over this energy, which is 3.65 times 10 to the negative 19.
18. Uh, plug that into your calculator. Be careful about the order of division here. You don't want to get a bracket in the wrong place. Um, and you get 5.45 times 10 to the negative 7 meters. Question 13. A photon of wavelength 400 and sorry 540 nanometers just uh, in case I you accidentally use that later I'm going to say uh, 540 times 10 to the negative 9 meters uh, collides with a isolated with an isolated stationary electron as shown in figure 11.1 uh, the photon is deflected elastically by the electron. The wavelength of the deflected photon is uh, 544 nanometers. State what is meant by a photon. So this is just uh, using your little bit of knowledge about quantum mechanics. So it is a quantum of energy in the form of electromagnetic radiation. Just a good definition to bother to learn. On figure 11.1, .1, draw an arrow to indicate the approximate direction of motion of the deflected electron. Um, so if remember, for this, uh, just think about uh, conservation of momentum. Conservation, I'll just put P for momentum. Um, so what we have beforehand, we have uh, some uh, momentum going in from this one, zero momentum from that one. So I'm expecting uh, to get out momentum going to the right. Um, so my deflected electron is now uh, still going to the right, but also down. Uh, so I would expect my electron to travel at that kind of direction uh, with uh, so that the uh, vertical components of the momentums are identical uh, in order to uh, conserve it. So something like that. Last but not least, question 14. A slice of conducting material has its phase QRLK normal to the uniform magnetic field of flux density B, as illustrated below. I just use a diagram, to be honest. Uh, electrons enter the slice traveling perpendicular to the phase uh, PQKJ, again, that's kind of shown in the diagram. State the direction of force on an electron due to movement of the electrons in the magnetic field. So for this one, um, again, using Fleming's left-hand rule, your first finger for field should be pointing uh, towards the right. Your second current finger, um, that should be pointing uh, out of the page towards you, because remember, if electrons are traveling that way, current is traveling that way. Um, and when you find that, you will find that your thumb, which is showing the motion, um, that is going down. So you just put the correct fields in there. That's B, that's force. Uh, so the direction is downwards. And then identify the phases using letters in figure 8.1, between which the potential difference is developed. So the electrons are going to start to be pushed down to here, leaving a positive charge up here. So it's going to be between phase P, Q, R, S. Uh, it's gone that way around, but I just like to put it in, alph in alphabetical order. And uh, J, K, L, N, because it's between this phase and this face.